very much, Steve. So as Steve just said, I'm going to be talking today um, through some aspects of the work I've been doing for a few years that looks at the relationships between patents and health in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, but I'm also quite interested in the global picture. Um, now this is, just to give a bit of context, this is um, work that I started doing several years ago in 2003 as part of my PhD and have since carried on doing with a new case study and I'm trying to bring all the thoughts I'll be sort of throwing around today in a monograph that I'm working on at the moment. Um, now, what I do with this, um, this project in general is to try to unpack those quite complex relationships between patents and health in different sites, so in different sites within Africa, in two different African countries, namely Djibouti and Ghana, um, but also within international institutions and, and within within different lo local global contexts and mixed local and global contexts. Um, I'm also really interested in using this example to reflect more broadly on the has of studying law in practice, so on the has of studying legal objects such as patents, that we may, we may sometimes take for granted the relationships between law on papers and law in action, for example, and I'm quite interested in seeing how actually those things play out um, in the practice and how we can go about understanding them. So today I'm going to try to, um, to flesh out some of the key ways in which I have seen this relationship between patents and health articulated in the two case studies I've done. Um, and I'm hoping that this will, help, um, this will help us have a discussion maybe about the ways in which, in which IP is being deployed in practice and what this means, what this means for how we should look at it and what this means for the practice of access to health in general. Um, so the picture might be quite a messy one um, in many ways and I think, I think the whole project is quite a messy one because those relationships are, are in, in so many different places. Um, but I'm actually hoping that maybe that's part of the message, that the legal is quite a, quite a fluid space and that understanding it as such is a big part of understanding how it works. Um, now I'll start by giving you a bit of background and this might be quite basic stuff for some of you, this might be new things for others so I just want to run over that quite quickly. Um, now the debate on intellectual property and access to health is one that has become talked about quite a lot in the media, in different arenas. Um, and to put it very simply, it all came, well it all originated with the trade related aspects of intellectual property agreement or TRIPS agreement that I'll be talking about a lot, um, which is a World Trade Organization agreement and the first, the first agreement to set substantial standards of, of intellectual property across mm -hmm. the world. Now, this has been important because until this international law was taken, patent law was decided and intellectual property in general were regulated at the national level. So each national state would decide how to, how to, to form their intellectual property system depending on their own, their own national interests. Um, and now this isn't really the case. There is still flexibility, there is still laws made at the national level, but they have to meet quite high international standards. Now, in the field of pharmaceutical patents, there has always been quite a difficult debate because until 1995 and the TRIPS agreement, a lot of countries had quite light systems of protection for pharmaceutical patents. And that was for several reasons. You had countries such as India, that's been talked about quite a lot, that had this as a policy choice, so had decided to be quite light on pharmaceutical patents because that allowed them to reverse engineer drugs and that allowed them on the long term to grow a local industry that is now quite thriving. Um, but then there was also a lot of countries such as Djibouti which just never really engaged with intellectual property, never had any interest in doing so, never had any expertise and that's a very different situation from the high profile India one. Um, in Africa there were also quite a lot of countries that had intellectual property rules that had been the same for many years and had never been changed and so TRIPS re restarted a whole debate and required quite a lot of countries to up their standards in IP. Um, now the pre-TRIPS situation had become a real concern for big pharma in general, so for pharmaceutical companies in general, because countries like India, who had done well in creating a generic industry, could also replicate drugs very cheaply, very easily, and there was a lot of issues for big pharma about whether their drugs could be copied too easily. Um, now again, in a nutshell, that turned into quite a lot of lobbying of Western governments in the 90s, which later on led to the TRIPS agreement. 
Um, and TRIPS has been very, very criticized for being one example where we see private interest seizing international law and, and, and the law being the reflection of private interest rather than the public ones. Um, now, what's interesting with TRIPS as well is that soon after it was signed, it turned into something <coughs> very different. So when there were debates about TRIPS, it was all about industrial development. What's good for India? What's good for the US? What's good for Big Pharma? What's good for different entities in terms of, um, of industrial growth. And very soon after, people started realizing that actually all this may also have quite a lot of impact on health. Um, and that kicked off, that kicked off just you know, from 95 onwards. Um, so what we saw then was IP moving from quite a specialist area of people interested in industry and inter interested in intellectual property to being something that was of interest to a much bigger set of um, of groups, including activists, including the general public, etc. And what we saw was one, one fairly straightforward, simple narrative about what TRIPS was going to do. Um, so the story, or the, the access to medication narrative in some way, was, well, you have now this WTO agreement, you have the TRIPS, that's going to be translated into national laws all around the globe including in countries like Ghana and Djibouti. Djibouti is looking enormous on that, that thing, it's supposed to be much smaller, <laughs> but that's as small as it could get. Um, so that's going to be translated into those countries. In turn, that means that there's going to be more and more patents in issued on more and more drugs. So all those spaces where before there were no patents will start having some. This in turn would probably have an impact on the price of medication. So you wouldn't have as much of the cheap generics that India has been making. Therefore, drugs would be more expensive. Therefore, access would be limited. Um, so that's that's one narrative, and that's one that has been um, used quite a lot, as I said, both by campaigners and and in quite a lot of academic writings as well. Actually, this this causal relationships between all those different things. Now, what I've been trying to do is to question this narrative and look at those different relationships in a context that was slightly different from what had been looked at more up to, up to quite recently. So there's been a lot of research in the first few years after TRIPS about India, about South Africa, about specific countries, and I just wanted to look at something a bit different. Now Djibouti seemed like something quite different at the time. Um, and the reason why I was interested, so Djibouti was the first of the two case studies and that's the one I worked on for my PhD. Now, um, the there were two main reasons why I was interested in it. One was, well, there was a lot about South Africa. There was little about the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. And Djibouti was sort of as far on the industrial spectrum as you could imagine from South Africa. It's the least developed country. There's very little industry. Um, it just sounded like an interesting example to take. Um, the other big reason why this was interesting is that Djibouti was one of the places that had never had IP. There was no IP regulation, there was no IP system, there was no IP institutions, and therefore the questions thrown by those new standards were very, very different from those you had in countries that had to change IP. There was no experts, nobody did IP, and I thought that was quite interesting to see you know, how the law gets translated and what happens in those contexts. Um, now after that, I started a second case study which is looking at Ghana, and what I wanted there was a case study that maybe was a bit less extreme than the case of Djibouti. So Ghana had had a patent law, Ghana had to change it in many ways, and had a much more organized, at least, at least on the surface of it, policy in terms both of the pharmaceutical market and in terms of IP in general. So I wanted to, to, to look at those two things, and I, I tried to stay away from the term comparing because I don't think that's what I've been doing, and I don't think that's what I want to do, compare the, the two, but I wanted to look at those two stories next to each other and see what sort of, of strategies and what sort of regulatory issues I could see with them. Uh, in terms of the method, it's been based on, on mainly qualitative interviews, a bit of observation, um, document analysis quite heavily for Ghana, far less so for Djibouti because there was hardly any document um, on those type of issues. Um, but we can, we can talk about that again later if you want. Now the other point is my research when my research started, it was quite largely inspired by ANT, by actor network theory. Um, and so the PhD really was, was a sort of ANT study, and I've still, I'm still really inspired by some of the ideas there, so I'm sure that will come out from the way I talk about all this. I mean, there's been quite a lot of emphasis on fluidity, materiality, 
issues, of, um, ideas of deployment, embedment, etc. in the way I've been looking at those things. Um, but increasingly, I've been interested in seeing, in testing ANT with that and seeing whether it has anything to tell us and what it can tell us when taken to a different context and if we try to use it to look at, at transnational legal regulations, basically. So, you know, is it the, the, the ideas of the tool is that actually those are tools we could use in different contexts? How does it work when we're looking at something that is so far away from the original sites of ANT? But again, that's not really, I won't really talk about the theory so much today. I just want to, to throw in ideas about, um, about the substance. Now, that's quite a long introduction, but hopefully that gives you a bit of the background. Um, now, there's four different points I want to concentrate on today when looking at what, what trips and pharmaceutical patents in action might be doing, at what they might be about. Um, I want to start by talking about le legal translation of the tools. So I want to start by raising a few questions about that first, first part of the causation we had seen. So, you know, intellectual property, global intellectual property agreement getting translated into different countries. Is that, is that really a straightforward relationship or not? Um, I then want to talk about what it means not to have patents. So what does it mean to look at a context like Djibouti where there is no intellectual property rule. Does it mean that you get all those generic that the market gets flooded with a, a whole sort of, of drugs or is it something different? And, and actually I'll, I'll explain that, well, it was something pretty different. Um, so I'll be talking about the extent to which patents counterintuitively may find ways of acting away from official regulation. Um, I'll then turn to discussing how these, poten these potential extra legal effects of patents are looked at and visaged and, and, um, and countered by policymakers in Ghana. So how do policymakers keen to promote the use of generic go about it, go about trying to make sure that patents stay restrained to what legally they're supposed to be doing? And finally, I want to discuss the other ways that IP seem to matter to me anyways, to medication and health in my country case studies. Namely, I want to look at the indirect ways in which TRIPS has been acting as an actor in the um, access to medication campaign. So what has TRIPS changed about the way we think about medication and therefore about global actions in this, in this area? So if we start by looking at issues of um, legal implementation, I've put a few pictures of Djibouti on Martin's request. We wanted to, <laughs> to have pretty pictures so you'll see what it looks like. Um, now, the first step, as I said, in understanding what patents mean for access to medication and for the local context is to question how they get translated into national legislation. And the story here already varies a lot depending on where you are and who you're speaking to, both across the two countries and within the two countries. Um, now again, the situation has been quite different and the changes required in Ghana were much, more, much smaller, much more straightforward in terms of implementation than they were in Djibouti. So I'll be talking a bit more about Djibouti in this, um, in this first part. Um, now again, the challenge that Djibouti was facing in implementing TRIPS and has been facing because the final deadline for implementation was this year only, um, is that you have to create a whole new system, a whole new legal system, and that's quite a big task. Um, and quite early on, it's been met with a degree of skepticism by local actors in terms of, you know, how powerful this international law should actually be. So, you know, we have the assumption that you have the global rules, therefore states have to comply with it. Um, and this is an illustration about, you know, the sort of, well, actually, what happens if we don't? You know, the way it works is that it doesn't change anything unless someone complains, which technically is true with the WTO. Um, we saw small that hopefully no one is going to complain. And I think this attitude was there at the background in both countries. You know, yeah, international law, we need to try to respect it. We just need to stop people from complaining. That's what it actually means. Um, and that's, that's quite different from saying you need to comply fully with international law. Um, but nevertheless, work started, work has started since 2002 in Djibouti very, very slowly in trying to design this new system, in trying to design intellectual property. Um, so a law was adopted in the end in 2009 and officially there is now a law, there is now a patent office that exists in the country. But there is a difference between having law on paper and having law that can actually work. Um, and this is a quote from 
a phone interview I did with the person in charge of implementing IP and GPT, because again, when you talk about the IP team, it's actually one person um, doing all this. Um, and she explained to me, you know, the first, the first part of the quote was quite cheerful. Well, I'm, I'm quite excited. We've just, just got off the phone with the minister and we finally have offices in which we can put the patent office. We've been waiting since 2009, so we've been waiting for two years to have the patent office, you know, home somewhere. And then more sarcastically, she went on to explain that, well, now we just have to wait for the government to find space to put the staff who's currently in those offices we're getting, and that could obviously take quite a while. Um, so that's just a little, a little anecdote, I guess, to highlight some of the difficulties still in translating law into practice. It's one thing to have the law, it's one thing to say we have a patent office. Actually, the reality is that, well, there is no office as such. There is just the concept of a patent office floating around. But the problems of law in action are much bigger than this. So you create the law, you create the institutions, you may find the offices. All this is one thing, but then you want the people who are at the end of the line to actually follow the law and actually change their behavior. Ultimately, you know, patents are meant to be there so that the pharmaceutical market is filtered in a certain way and that people who buy and sell drugs only buy and sell certain types of drugs. Um, now, one of the big problems seems to be getting enough communication going between the people who are creating the law, so the IP offices, the trade and industry offices who do that, and the people within the public health field, whether they are medics or the people who actually you know, allocate the drugs, choose the drugs, etc., whether they are the importers of the drugs, whether they are the public health um, government officials. And again, you know, the sense that came out from a lot of those interviews well, were actually you know, they may be doing all those things in that other ministry, but that's not really my business. That's not going to affect the way I work. Um, and finally, again, I think there are much bigger, um, bigger issues there about how we approach and think of the law. So, you know, the last quote I put here was from an interview with a Ghanaian official, again, which I think is really interesting for what it reveals about how we think about what it means to comply with the law, to follow the law. We can't break the law. So what we need to do is to find a way of going around the law, which I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I get my head around this one still, but I think it's quite, quite an interesting, um, interesting way of looking at it, and maybe that's what we all do, actually. Um, so there are many questions in there, and, and that's, that's just throwing some of them um, around. There are many questions about what it means to have these new standards in intellectual property, and I think it's very very problematic to take shortcuts and assume that there is a direct link between new rules, whether at the global or national level, and changes of behavior on the ground, and changes in practices on the ground. But there's also a lot of questions about what it means not to have any legal rules. So again, what does it mean to have a system like Djibouti still is, um, where you have no official no official patents existing at all, does it mean that we have just quite a, f a flexible and open market? Um, now, again, technically, the situation here is when we have a country like Djibouti with no patent rule, any medicine that may, may, may need to follow all the health and safety tests, but any medicine regarding, regardless of whether they are generic or not, should be able to legally come into the country. Um, but however, in Djibouti up to very, very recently, there was no drug, there was no generic drug entering the place, only branded medication. And that was not only um, patented, not only the patented versions of drugs that were still under patent, but also the previously patented version of drugs that already existed as generics in other places. So even for things such as paracetamol in pharmacies, you would actually only find the, the Defalgon, which is the French and the, the most common brand in France. Um, so there was no generics apart from very, very small pockets of donations, etc. And I can come back on that um, later if you want, but on the most dominant part of the market, branded medicines only. Um, and there was, in fact, a very strict, although it was officially an unregulated space, you actually had a de facto regulation process that seemed to be falling into place somehow to exclude quite a broad range of medicines from the market and to mean that in practice you only had that small set of very expensive drugs um, coming in. I've put another quote here from an interview um, from, from one of the pharmacists 
there going on, you know, patents, no patents, all the same here. And that's also another one that I think you can look at in two ways. Well, you know, I think he meant it won't make a difference if we have patents and actually won't make a difference because they were pretty strict in following what patents elsewhere would have told them to do. Um, now, I found all this very interesting because the question then becomes, what is it that regulates the market to make it look this way? If it's not the law, what is it that has law-like effects and make the market look actually more heavily regulated than we may have in Europe because all those other generics we get didn't seem to enter? Um, now, there's a whole lot of things that make the market look like this, and that's some of them. Um, so, I'll go over some of the factors and... and well, uh, yes, yeah, some of the factors that may explain this. Now, the first one is the, um, the general picture of how imports of medicines work in Djibouti, which is quite unusual. Um, it's all coming, well, it's, again, apart from a few small pockets, medicines coming from private pharmacies. So private pharmacies are the ones who import, with very, very little influence from the government. So that was talked about as quite a big problem for, for um, minister officials within the ministry. Um, now, at the time when I studied this research, there was only two pharmacists, now I think there are four of them who are established, and that's the only people who bring drugs into the country. Um, so because of the small number and because of the sort of shared monopoly of those few people within the whole country, they actually, actually don't really need to go out of their way to think about competition and that sort of thing, competitive, competitive. I'm not going to get into that, <laughs> uh, being competitive um, in terms of prices, etc. Um, now, in terms of who provided the drugs in Djibouti, there's only a few companies that did, and those were all part of big pharma, so big multinational um, groups providing the drugs in the country. There were several reasons given for this. Some of them were, well, Djibouti is very badly connected in terms of transport. It's pretty hard getting there. It's pretty hard getting stuff there. So when we know that we have a provider able to deliver very quickly, we tend to stick to this one because it makes sense. Um, other issues was you can't test drugs in Djibouti. So, you know, there's all those issues of drugs not being very reliable, not being very good quality. Maybe it is better to stick to the few providers we know are reliable. We don't have labs we can't test. Um, so there was a whole set of issues that explain why only some providers were used, which is different from explaining why the generics that those providers also make didn't enter the country. But there were other factors in terms of medical practice there that were quite um, interesting. So a lot of doctors in Djibouti are French doctors, a lot of them um, having been trained in France quite a few years ago. And there's a lot of habits in how you prescribe drugs. Now, one big thing is that doctors often tend to, pr to prescribe branded medication, which may not be such a problem in France itself because pharmacists can then substitute something else. But in Djibouti created problems because once a patient had managed to access a doctor, they were very reluctant on having the pharmacist changing anything. Not that I think they really, um, not that I think that that ever really occurred basically because I don't think the pharmacists were trying. Um, but basically the, the medical prescriptions all come up with a branded name and as one of the pharmacists put it, well, you know, patients don't want generics, they want what's written on the paper. And I think that's quite a common attitude, actually, even with patients here. Um, so the result of all this was that whilst patents in France and in many other places provide a temporary monopoly, usually of 20, drugs on so, on 20, year, of 20 years on some drugs, in Djibouti, this monopoly seemed to carry on almost indefinitely, where actually once a drug had become the usual one, it just stayed the one that was being imported. Um, and that's very interesting because, again, that's in a context where patents don't have any existence. They're just not supposed to be there. Um, so then, how do, you, how do you counteract this Djibouti effect? What we've seen in Djibouti is a story of how powerful patents may be as regulatory tools even beyond what the law about them is saying. So they find ways of acting that may be unexpected on plan, etc. Um, now, the practical and policy question then becomes how do you stop this phenomenon? How do you ensure that drugs other than the patented or post-patented um, version enter the country and are made available to patients? And again, that's very important because of the difference in prices between the branded and the generic drugs. Um, and in other terms, how do you make it possible for 
for Genrix that to, to break the many boundaries that get created by that 20 year monopoly that patents are giving, because actually in practice that's a bit what's happening. You've got this monopoly for 20 years and that gives a particular power to, to specific entities, to specific drugs. How do you make sure that you can move beyond that? Now the government in Ghana has been quite proactive in trying to do that, in trying to make generics, to put generics really within reach of as many patients as possible, but that's, that's quite difficult still in practice. Now I'm just going to go briefly over some of the strategies that they've used to try to do this. Um, now the first the first aspect of keeping patents within those official limits, so making sure that some generics, when legal, are available in Ghana, has been to increase the range of suppliers that are, that, that are providing medications. So encouraging different wholesalers to be established and encouraging them to look as far out as possible for new, new providers of medicines. And the government has been quite proactive in doing that. Um, However, this has also been made possible because of the ability of the government to keep a check on what drugs were actually provided and to test drugs when they were new entities within the country. And again, that's something that requires a sort of expertise that many places may not have and that Djibouti in particular didn't have. Um, another aspect of this has been the creation of a national health insurance scheme in Ghana, which is a fairly recent, um, fairly recent happening. And that basically allows patients to get free access to drugs um, as well as hospital treatment up to, the, up to a certain price level, which is the price of fairly cheap generic versions of the drugs. Now, as well as having become a tool for access to health and also for the government to keep the cost of medicines down, what this system has done is to facilitate the generalization and the use of generics within the country so it becomes more common within pharmacies to see and buy generics. It encourages pharmacies to buy them and it makes patients becoming more familiar with them. Um, there's also been quite a lot of direct intervention taken with um, varied, varied levels of success um, to try to get health professionals to change their attitude towards generics and therefore try to get patients to view generics differently and get used to them. Um, so, for example, it's now supposed to be the rule that doctors use the generic name of medicines when writing prescriptions. In practice, that's not always done, but the government is trying to push for this. And that's expected, again, to limit the, the risk of brand fidelity and the embedment of, pat of patents within medical prescription that was the norm in Djibouti. Um, now, in spite of all this, there's still many, many problems in practice, including to do with those perceptions of what generics are about, which actually are quite a big problem for many patients um, and for many health professionals. And again, it's interesting here to reflect on, on this indirect and secondary effect of patents in shaping what becomes seen as the normal drug or the proper drug, you know, the proper version of the drug. And then you have the generic, which is the slightly lower standard one. The, the, the medicine is the same but there is a different understanding of it, a different perception of it. Um, and it's also interesting if we start reflecting on the role of patents behind the scene to think about not only what patents has done in terms of shaping the proper drug, but also what patents has done in terms of shaping the essential or the necessary drug. And that's just a little bit, a little bit of an aside in, um, in my story here, but... Um, the concept of essential medicines is obviously quite important when you start talking about access to health in poor countries. Now, the, the World Health Organization draws a list, which is revised quite often, about what the essential medicines that every patient should be able to access in a sort of idealized health system um, should contain. So what are those drugs that we really, really need? And defenders of TRIPS and of strong patent rights have often argued that, well, actually, if you look at this list of medicines, what you see is that most of them are out of patents and therefore patents isn't really a problem for access to health or access to basic health care. Um, however, increasingly people are also critical of this narrative because actually the creation of the essential medicine list is very heavily dependent on issues of cost and of cost effectiveness, which means that drugs which are under patent tend to be kept out much more easily than drugs that have run out of patents. Um, so I think here what I'm, I'm hoping to, to have shown a bit is that there are many indirect ways in which patients actually see, um, in, in, in which patents shape what we actually see as being 
the right drug, the important drug, the proper drug, or the drug that patients should be taken. And I think that applies not only to how patients may perceive this, but also how policymakers at different levels are thinking about various drugs. Um, so all this was some of the effects of um, patents in practice. So some of the the games and, and activities that go on when patents are being deployed or, have been, or, or when patents either act or are being counteracted in different ways. But there's another set of issues now that I want us to think about a bit. Um, and I want to talk briefly about what TRIPS may have changed or what those debates on TRIPS and on um, intellectual property generally may have changed about the way in which um, in which we think about health and we think about access to treatment in poor countries. And here I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier about the role of TRIPS in the Access to Medicines campaign and the role that TRIPS has played, so the role that those new intellectual property rules have played in triggering a lot of public outrage and a lot of, of public opposition to, to big pharma in general and to the pharmaceutical industry in general. Um, so I'm going to start by raising some quite general questions about this and then I'll talk about AIDS very briefly, more specifically, because it's quite a, quite a specific issue in all this. Um, now the general questions here have to do with, again, what TRIPS has done in shaping the Access to Medicine campaign. Um, now since the public health dimension of TRIPS has been highlighted very shortly after it was adopted, um, there's been a renewed attention to the importance of supporting access to cheap medication within poor countries. And there's been quite a lot of programs that have emerged around the globe, either focusing, well, either from NGOs, from charities, or also from global organizations, international institutions, um, donor countries, um, etc., focusing on making access to drugs easier. Um, so, for example, the situation that I've described in Djibouti of having no generics has slowly been targeted by the World Bank who's trying to, to open up the market and has succeeded quite recently in doing that, that um, with, with some, yeah, some issues that I'll come back to. Um, the industry as well has actually changed its attitude quite a lot since the TRIPS debate. So since the industry has been named and changed in some way, there's been quite a lot of access programs, quite a lot of medication, anti-HIV medication in particular, given much more cheaply to developing countries. And all this raises a number of questions at several levels. Firstly, um, in terms of policy, it may be that actually, in some ways, TRIPS has facilitated access to generic medicines in some parts of the world. So it may be that actually in Djibouti, if they hadn't been TRIPS, they wouldn't have been as much concerned about generic medicines if the, if the sort of global awareness hadn't been triggered. That has come, again, with some difficulties. So there's been a lot of issues highlighted about the difficulties in, in coordinating different projects in donations not always being done in ways that are appropriate to the local needs. So there's been actually quite a lot of criticism of specific campaigns and of how they work together. Um, and there's also some side effects. So, you know, in the last couple of years when the Djibouti market has slowly opened up, one of the first impact has been that the informal drug market has also opened and the counterfeit medicines that didn't really enter before are starting to flourish a bit everywhere in the country. Um, but there's also more theoretical issues here and for example we may want to reflect on how this has linked with the phenomenon of, of pharmaceuticalization and Martin and I have been trying to think about that um, and whether you know whether maybe actually we've been paying more attention um, as we've been paying more attention to the difficulty of accessing medicines maybe we've been reshaping the place that medicines and drugs may be playing in healthcare and what healthcare may be about in different places. Um, now, the um, issue of AIDS is also quite a specific one and I haven't talked about it explicitly, um, explicitly yet today because I, I like to actually see it as something that's quite quite isolated from the rest because it has become like this in, um, in a lot of the discourses. So the links between AIDS and TRIPS have always been very, very tight. The reason for it is quite straightforward. Um, Anti-HIV medications, so ARV antiretrovirals, are often patent in medicines and therefore they're often expensive. Um, and therefore they have become quite early the main focus of the Access to Medicines campaign. And a lot of the opposition to TRIPS has focused on AIDS because of the global AIDS crisis, because of the, the, the powerful narrative of it, 
but also because actually those drugs were particularly difficult to access. Um, and it has been even more so the case since it became um, since it became known that well, since Indian generic industry started advertising that they could give drugs for about one dollar a day, when actually the treatment of the patented version is much much more than this. Um, now the knock-on effect of these campaigns and the more contested dimension of this is that they seem to also have reshifted quite a lot of attention to AIDS. So as much as people have welcomed a lot of the projects that aim to facilitate access to AIDS medication, there's a lot of voices now that are saying, well, actually, maybe all this focus on modern drugs has taken us away from the fact that many people don't accept the basic drugs, the cheap ones, the ones that we should be able to send quite easily. Um, and maybe as well, there are other issues that aren't really even to do with drugs, and we have sort of forgotten from, from there because of focusing so heavily on this particular, um, particular disease. Um, that was the case again in Djibouti where a lot of money for AIDS has been going and health professionals have been very critical of it because they're just not managing to use it for various reasons that I can, um, I can explain. Um, now, that whole question of what place AIDS in particular holds in the debate I think is quite an important one. Um, and it has, it has come to become, well it has become a disease that is a specific area of policy. So a lot of, for example, in, in Ghana, in the way um, the way drugs are imported is different if you're looking at generics in general or at AIDS-related generics in particular. Um, and again, there are plenty of reasons why this is the case, why there are some aspects of AIDS that need to be studied as a particular issue. But what's quite interesting is that progressive separation of it from other diseases and how in turn this has become quite criticised for being an overemphasis on something as opposed to, um, to others. Um, now, this again is one, I guess what, what you may want to call side effects of TRIPS or non-expected or knock-on effects of TRIPS. You know, what has it done not only for how we think about drugs in general, but also about how we think about specific disease, specific issues, access to modern drugs, as opposed to access to basic medication, etc. Um, so how do you bring all those things together and, and what, what can we say with all this? Well, I think there's two, two different issues here that I've been sort of playing with and trying to think about. The first one is a, I guess, fairly practical question. How do we how, how should we be thinking about these relationships between pat patents and health? And actually, are there any other shortcuts that maybe have been taken in some narrative that are quite problematic? Because, well, no, it doesn't seem that there is a straight link between increased intellectual property and decreased access to, to drugs. And actually, maybe following this narrative has quite a lot of impact in how we are maybe at times uncritically um, addressing what we see as being the problem. And also there's another layer of things here about what it means to look at legal tools. So what actually does it mean to look at intellectual property or to look at patents? In some ways, you know, the policies of Ghana in terms of access to drugs maybe don't really have to do with patents directly, but yet when they are there at the background and when they are playing a part, maybe as, as lawyers or as people engaging with laws or regulation, we should still be looking at them. So I think there are maybe some questions here as well about how we want to, to conceptualize legal tools um, and, and whether there is any ways of defining something such as the legal and the legal space in general or whether actually we need to move to much more subtle ways of analysing this. Um, so I think I'll leave it to that and maybe have questions if you have any. Great, thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Um,